Hey everyone, it's Tom with Fresh Vintage. Today we have a very special guest, we have Mike here. Mike, thanks so much for being here, man. Thank you. What, what, uh, we've got an awesome Porsche here. Tell me a little bit about it. I think you said it's a 53, right? It's a 1953. Okay. All right. Um, every car club has, a, like, a, I was looking for an old 356, uh, maybe a pre-A, an A, just to find and make mechanically sound, not expensive, and I've been looking for years. And uh, every car club has like a curmudgeon group, like your 68 Camaro has the wrong valve stem covers, et cetera. So the 356 Club was, I was looking at their chat room, and they go, there's a car on eBay, don't buy it. He wants 21.5 for it. It's a rust bucket and he won't answer any questions. And I called over to shop, I had just sent the picture, and I said, if this shows up totally a rust bucket, can we part it out and get my 21.5 back? And they go, Mike, we don't know. And so it showed up and we noticed those are turbo rims. They're asymmetric to the, each side of the car and they blow okay. cold air in onto the, the brakes. Okay. I go, hmm. And then the bumperettes are alloy. The, okay. they, the original ones were steel. Okay. Why are those alloy? Yeah. And then the odometer has a tenth of a mile marker in it. No Porsche had that in it yeah. except the race car. The seat belts were out of a P51 Mustang. The rally okay. clock's out of a B24 Liberator. Okay. The shifter knob was pinstripe. We look inside here? Uh, yeah, we have to go to the other side. Oh, let's go um, to the other side here, okay. And, um, and um, the horn button was wrong. Okay. So, and it's a 300 millimeter steering wheel, which is race. So, um, we're like, what's going on? Yeah, what, what's so the I story? So I sent away yeah. for this birth certificate from Porsche. Normally you pay $100, they send you a piece of paper. It's really not worth the $100, but instead the curator called me and um, then they offered to acquire the car, and I said no. They upped the offer. Wow, okay. They upped the offer, which was, was, was multiple times for what I paid for the car. I said no, and then they said, we'd like to participate in the restoration of the car. Wow, and okay. they kind of really lent their, the queue of people that do it in the United States that yeah. know what they're doing. I got to move way up the queue. But oh, wow. they provided shocks, the original shocks. The windshield was original, but it was green, delaminating, and bubbling. Um, and they provided an original windshield wow, and okay. um, some other little bits and pieces, but the car is all original. Yeah. And so then they told me who had acquired the car, like Ferrari, yeah. all race cars are sold to privateers. Most race cars are sold to privateers afterwards. Yeah. And it was a naval commander who, uh, wealthy, served in World War II. His ship got sunk um, and um, his destroyer was number 61. So okay. he ran the number 61 everywhere he raced in the car. Yeah. After he door dinged it and dinged it a while, he, this is original color, he changed it to navy blue, naval okay. guy. Yeah. But he co-founded Road America. He was the chairman of the board. He raced at the first race at Road America. Wow. Okay. He sponsored Carl Haas and Newman Haas Racing. And this is one of the very first factory per, uh, cars that the average Joe could buy to go racing with back in the day. Okay. So, so it's a pretty rare thing. Um, wow. And then, what, what's the, uh, do you want to show, take a look? I'm going to show you the engine, but I'm going to yeah. show you about the interior in a little bit. Okay. Um, so, everybody knows what the 550 Spider Hearth 4 cam engines are. This is a, has the same bottom end, but it's a push rod engine. That's okay. a 70 year old bake light distributor cap. The, uh, the 550 Spider that James Dean died in, these are the same carburetors, okay. type of car carburetors are in there. Magnesium case. Everything only put out 50 horsepower that Porsche had back then, except these cars put out um, 75 horsepower. Okay. Which, like nice. today in Bugatti numbers, I have a 500 horsepower <laughs> yeah. Bugatti. Yeah. I have a 750 <laughs> horsepower Bugatti. So, um, first super designation car, first synchronized transmission, first one piece glass, so it's bent windshield. Yeah. And then if you come in here and look a little bit, um, it ran a prototype fuel gauge. Okay. So you have to pressurize the fuel tank. Wow, look at and, that. And that's what I'm doing. I'm pressurizing it. It's out of, they put them in the fighter plane. You're so actually move, pumping move. it. Okay, to and pressurize now it. pumps it. up. If you see the tenth of a mile marker on the odometer, they uh, never, none of them had tenth of a mile. And then that's the horn amazing. button, the horn button was wrong. So we're like, why would they replace the horn button when the rest of the car was deteriorating because of wear and tear and stuff yeah. like that? Well, the first batch of car oh, horn buttons made were ordered destroyed because they didn't match the the crest for Stuttgart. And okay. so Porsche ordered all the horn buttons destroyed, but some of the cars escaped the factory with the original horn button. Okay. So now my piece of junk is on a tanium, you know, <laughs> horn <laughs> button. <laughs> um, yeah, let's pop then, the, we'll pop the hood and we'll see uh, what's under the hood. You look at the seats, because he was a naval commander and he was six foot tall. That's really out of a Mercedes. 
but okay. it was but it has all the Porsche hardware. Yeah. So they had to order it and do it for him. So I reached out to the family after uh, the, the Porsche told me who the owner was. Um, and um, he had died the month I had acquired the car. Oh, His 92-year-old wow. brother answers the phone and said, my niece will be ecstatic to know this car is out there. So when I got in contact with her, she sent me all the trophies, all the logbooks, all the programs, all the oh, wow. film of it racing. Here she is. She's now 77 years old. This okay. is the car after he painted it navy blue. Um, there it is at Elkhart Lake ice racing. That's me pedaling it. I'm getting passed by real drivers at Laguna Seca. Um, the, uh, she sent me all the trophies, logbooks, and programs. I obviously can't carry them everywhere. Yeah. I took his son for a lap. His son never got to see his dad race. I took him for a lap at Laguna Seca. Mm -hmm. He's crying. Oh, I was wow. going to put it on social media, but every other word out of his mouth was the F-bomb. <laughs> this is Evan great. This is Evan, oh my God. My dad's car, blah, 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 blah. So it raced at the, uh, there it is before they painted the color. Okay. The reason, he, he couldn't run 61 everywhere because different regions people have it. And then at nationals, you had to run like F-production. Yeah. But everywhere he could, he ran 61. Where he couldn't, he would flip the number around. And yeah, I see that. Like that. Yeah. So F well, there, that's ice racing. Enough. I have this on film. In okay. this race, it finished third. They used spent Christmas trees. They used masking tape to make bras, and they put yeah. sand and gravel and straw down to make the track surface. Instead yeah. of putting Navi tires, they went yeah. the they went the opposite. They made, I was wondering. Yeah, they, they made Navi road. <laughs> and, <laughs> Navi road. And so this is the last race at Watkins Glen. It's a okay. third in class. I have that trophy. Okay. Um, the nationals. First race at Road America. This is it getting up the track. Okay. Um, farther up the track. And there he is off to it. And then car before his SCCA number. So I reached out. There's a naval commander. So I reached out to the Watkins Glen Motorsports History Center to see yeah. if they had any records of the car. They said, we may have, this is the SCCA National Championship at Offord Air Force Base. They go, we may have something, Mike, for you. So they, I now have the picture, but they sent this. That's a very famous Glocker. That yeah. race. That's Jim Kimberly of Kimberly Clark in a Ferrari powered Oscar. And there's my car coming out of tech inspection in the background. Okay. So I have that picture nice. now. So, so I got that going for me. Yeah. Um, he raced Skull Wing at Bahama Speed Week. There's okay. the daughter is again okay. with the car number. That's his wife. And um, that's Bahama Speed Week. He had his Skull Wing. He beat Roger Penske in the day. He had a bale of hay. It's just amazing. A, this is just sitting. What did you say in a meat locker? In a meat locker in in Elkhart Lake. This wow. is what it looked like, though all the parts were with it and the motor and stuff. There's the story of how the uh, horn buttons were all ordered destroyed by Ferrari because it wasn't it wasn't accurate. Okay. You know, but it's now on titanium, and I have every program that the, it ever raced in. And she wrote because her dad got her press credentials for every venue. Yeah. She wrote all the place winnings past place 10 the official ones that you know oh so, wow so i gave that to the center at watkins glen the daughter gave me the original key pop from dr portia to max hoffman to the naval commander okay. and she gave it to me at dinner oh wow look at that so that's the original that's there's less amazing. than 75 of these ever made yeah for, mostly for members of the perch and yeah. for, and portia families and then just because it's beyond you know what auto unions were? The cars that raced pre-war uh, yeah. for Germany that tried to set land speed records. Mm -hmm. And um, well, these cars, when they first came out, the race ones only had 1,100 cc, so they shaved the head and they reached back in time. Have you ever seen a spark plug like that? Oh my gosh. See that, see the electrode? Yeah. Not only that, yeah. because they shaved the head, so, and it's a hemispheric piston, it would hit. So they wanted to give it more clearance for and then more compression. Yeah. They have a tool that you put down there that adjusts that, gap in yeah. and out of that plug that That's little amazing. electrode going in wow. and out so un 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 <laughs> yeah anyway. you won't see those on ebay anytime soon <laughs> so that's the story and um and because porsche nobody cared about these cars when you go you see their le mans winning cars you see their um uh, but then but if servicemen hadn't brought these cars back in droves yeah. and word of mouth get out and they were the grassroots racers and the, uh, Porsche, as we know it today, wouldn't exist. Yeah. And so this is a living DNA link to Porsche's yeah, heritage. And because of that, my wife and I are the plus one and plus two, and they invite us everywhere, and and we're gonna we're happy to go. I was yeah, a parts absolutely. driver working my way through college, and so it was in their corporate headquarters for the last six months as one of the icons of Porsche racing. 
film. And Mike, what what color did you say it was? It's uh, it's called mod gray in German, okay. but it's okay. fashion gray in the United States. Fashion and, gray, and, okay. And uh, we found the, the original panels were there, so once yeah. we got down, and then when you moved up in plate, you could see yeah. it. And there was a guy in California who was a repainter for Porsche back then. He had the original glass. I don't know if you've seen those. They have like a, mm -hmm. uh, it's a, um, oh, not a, a book call or one of those Brazilian birds. Yeah. And it says glasserate on it. Oh, okay. And it's one okay. stage, highly toxic. They yeah. don't use that stuff anymore. <laughs> Paint, but that's what we used to put the car back together with. So. Thank you so much. Oh, really beautiful, beautiful car. Thank you for taking the time to restore and bring it back to life and telling the story. We love telling the story of cars on Fresh Vintage. So thank you very, very much. If you like classic cars, if you like muscle cars, if you like Porsches, if you like stories told about cars, if you like DIY and tech, Fresh Vintage is your channel. Please like and subscribe and make sure you keep it between the ditches. Because I'm figuring out how to pay for his grandchildren's college education. Well, every car that, you know, didn't have, this is the gas gauge. Wow.
right now. It's got just a skosha texture, mm -hmm. but you get this thing outside, you'll never see that. So I went around a couple more places and get the details off on it. I didn't see what kind of you know, you know.
Something of a sports car race on ice. These amateur drivers will compete against one another over a slippery sliding one and a quarter miles of lightly graveled ice. For weeks, these car owners have been preparing their little high-performing cars for this event. This little Italian Seattle with its 26 horsepower Crosley engine carburetor adjustment. And in spite of its size, this car will race against larger, more powerful cars. For this is one race where driving skill and not horsepower is going to win. Here is another worthy contender, a 220 horsepower Chrysler powered Allard. Prior to the event, each car was passed this technical inspection committee. Cars are checked for numerous safety factors, such as safety belts, stoplights, brakes, steering linkage, fuel leaks, tires, wheel bearings, and exhaust systems. Also for general cleanliness and appearance. For these are true sports cars, not hopped up jalopies. The ice race brings many participants to the Twin Cities, plus the interesting spectators like this 1908 Model T Ford, negotiating the downtown traffic. The morning of the race found the officials out early, inspecting the course. For unseasonal thaws that threatened to cancel the event, absence of a snow safety wall will find these drivers spinning freely across open ice if they should get off the gravel course. Morning also found the drivers out making last-minute adjustments, taping up lights and chrome for protection against flying gravel. Novice drivers were given road tests to determine their degree of driving skill, and the all-important hours of practice were put in to accustom all drivers to the conditions of the course. And here's the lineup to the five-lap Pennzoil Trophy Dash for cars of all sizes. In addition to the small cars entered for the first race, there are Jaguar 27, Cecil Barringer, Jaguar number four, Dr. Daniel Halverson, Chevrolet Corvette number 20, Russ Lee, Old Special number six, Bill Peters, Supercharged MG number 12, Chuck Huntington, Jaguar number 21, Chris Tonida, Jaguar number seven, Bud Stahl, Ford Special number 17, Johnny Crea, Allard number three, Don Scoglone, Jaguar Coupe 26, Ted Hotchkiss. Drivers get their crash helmets fastened and goggles adjusted. This will be a running start with that beautiful Studebaker you saw there on the outside selling the pace. Now, in this race, we will have a pace lap. The Studebaker joined the pacing, the cars, of course, getting properly lined up at the same time with pace lap affords all drivers the opportunity of checking the cars very thoroughly to make sure that they are perfect running order before and end this race. Out of the S-curve, we come still lined up. The Chevrolet Corvette on the outside there, you see, in the back. And around the north turn we come, perfect lineup. They get an early flash from the starters, the lead cars seem not to realize the race is on, but here comes the average. Skogmo off to pass the entire field. And as they go to the S-curve, we find with Halverson tonight on Peterson, and also passed all the smaller cars. Watch these babies come around the curve. On there, expert driving. The Corvette's still on the outside here. Well, a little slow start, but he'll be back in that place in a moment. Here's what this race looks like from the seat of the fifth place car number 10. Being a ton coming on that thing. Push it. And those lights flash off and on. Number four car. Watch around this curve. In close to the inside to save time and distance. Out of the S curve and down the straightaway. Car rockets back and forth a couple of times. Now get straight back. Out the outside to dig in deep to come around the curve. Seventy miles an hour down the straightaway they come, and as they gather more momentum, and now the supercharged MG passing number ten to move into fifth place. It'll be curve again. Watch the slides here. Robertson sliding dangerously, and it's a collision on the back stretch. It looks like Countryman and Huntington are out. In the meantime, it's still Scogmo diving the Allard number three and first. Halverson with Jaguar number four and second. Tonight,a and Jaguar number twenty-one and fourth, and Peters with the old special number six. Camel number four position. Past the eyes of the camel they roll. And it'll be S curve again. This is where driving skill paid off. Countryman waved into the pits to inspect damage after that last match. Calvin's was past Chicago and Peters is now moving up in the second. In the under 1500cc class, it's many a first in the MZ. Now Antwerp is second in the Porsche and Putin third. There goes Stahl off the gravel, helplessly spinning across the glare ice. In the fourth lap, it's still Halverson in first now, Jaguar number four, the over 1500 cc, and many in first from the under 1500. Round car number 28. Now across the ice they come. Into the straightaway, and more distance now between these cars. But three here bunched up very closely. Out of the S. 
There goes Connor Blade, Jamelian, in with Smith, and he's out of the race. Going his car very wide out. See if he can run on the track. He's also this race. The race on the back stretch is taken out. Peterson, Scott Moore, it's Tonight, taking second place. Johnny Creel third. Here's the winner, Dr. Halverson. Tonight is second, Johnny Creel third. The other 1500cc class, Jerry Millie, as M.G. came in first in class and fourth overall. Van Ann Werben was second, Van Hooten third. We are entertained. everybody this is Bob Brooks for the story of the first sports car race ever held in the state of Iowa this one on the airstrip at the Iowa City Airport and more than 100 cars gathered at the machine shop for the first uh, inspection to start things off on May the 1st drivers from California and from Florida and from eight Midwestern states were on hand to have their cars inspected by the Sports Club of America before the races got underway the next day all makes and models of sports cars were on hand and the drivers, at the same time, while having their cars inspected, their tires checked, and their piston displacement looked at, at the same time, we're comparing notes and we're gossiping a little bit about why their sports car was best or why it would perform the best the following day. A race program had been set up of some seven races for the next day, so these cars were getting a good going over. Now, these drivers, more than 100 of them, would come here at their own expense, and their only glory for racing would be a winner's trophy. No money, no guarantee. They had to furnish the automobile, they had to furnish the fuel, the pit crews, and to drive the car, and after the day is over, the only thing they could hope to win was a trophy. So you see, uh, these fellows love their automobiles. Here's the race course as it was laid out at the Iowa City Airport on the concrete racing strip. One and nine-tenths miles. The course is distance, so we'll have a lot of terrific turns and a lot of thrilling races to tell you about today. Here's the race course as it looked the day of the event, May the 2nd. Heavy clouds and a light rain started to fall in the morning. It was to get heavier as the day went along. The first race, 19 miles for novice drivers under 1,500 cc class. Open only to qualified drivers with one race or less experience, and they're off for the first race of the day. This afternoon, we want to bring you up to date on these sports cars and the way they look and the fellows that are driving them, where they came from. Maybe if you've never seen a sports car race before, you'll get just a little idea of the thrills and spills and the worrying around the turns and the speed that goes with one of these events. We hope to enlighten you a little bit on the type of car, so that when you do go out to see one of these sports races, you'll get all of the enjoyment that you possibly can out of it. Now, car number 40 in this event was driven by Captain W.H. Cooper from the Chinook Air Force Field in the state of Illinois. And the Chinook Air Force Base has been the headquarters for some of the best Midwest sports car races these past few years. A lot of these drivers have raced there, have raced in Europe and all over the United States. There is Paul Shaw, who is a guiding light behind the event in Iowa City for the Optimist Club and who did a great job in giving Iowa City another sports first. These cars have raced not only in this country, but abroad too. And here's the winner of the first race of the day. He is Lloydton of Eastland, Illinois, in a Glocker Porsche. And now the second race, 19 miles for novice drivers, over 1,500 cc, open only to qualified drivers with one race or less experience. They get their pre-race instructions, telephonic communication with the backstretch to make sure that the course is clear. And they're off in the second race of the day. Immediately moving into the lead is George Bear of Cedar Rapids. There's a boy skid and whir around those turns that are made sloppy by the rain. Driving skill, the stamina of the automobile, all come into play in the second race. But mainly, since the event is only 19 miles, the driver's skill his ability to negotiate those turns in his race for the clock and in the race for his fellow driver means a great deal. We want to call to your attention some of the bales of hay that have been placed in the back stretch and in the turns in case one of these cars skids, he'll have some protection to try and keep him upright so that the concussion of the skid wouldn't be uh, enough to knock him over. 
These novice drivers don't look like novices as they negotiate these turns in fine fashion. The officials confer as car number 66 moves around close to the lead, Dr. John Park, the Triumph Roadster Special from Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Imagine that most of you never realized how many sports cars and sports car enthusiasts we have in the state of Iowa. But there are a great many of them, and most of them are here on this day. There's the old and the new, a fellow in the background on a horse as the cars of the modern age race at 100 miles an hour. He's there to keep the crowd back a little bit, but nevertheless uh, shows that there's still some use for old Dobbin, too. Down into the first turn, roaring towards the backstretch at the Iowa City Airport in the second race of the day. There's car number 19, driven by Bob Gatz, Jaguar XK120M from Chicago, Illinois. Again, the Cedar Rapids car. And now the finish of the second race and the winner, a Cedar Rapids boy, George Bear, in a Triumph Special. And now the third race. The drivers get their pre-race instruction and move to their cars. Car number six, that has a fine position in the front line is Stephen Peavy in an MGTD in Davenport, Iowa. The starter's ready. The green peg is up. Watch him now for the third race of the day, and they're off. 15 laps, 28 and 5 miles for production sports cars under 1,500cc class open only to qualified drivers with at least one race experience. These cars move down the home stretch after negotiating the first lap. A big field and a lot of traffic jams around the turns. Crowd around 4,000 on hand this afternoon watching this event. This is the third race, Class F2, and Norman Carlson of Itasca, Illinois, and a Porsche Sports is out in front. We want to tell you, too, about the story of the flags. As the spectators watch not only the race, but they keep a weathered eye on those flags, too. The green one, of course, the course is clear. The yellow flag is to use caution. The red flag means that the race has been stopped. The white flag means that there's an official car and ambulance on the race course. The yellow flag with horizontal red stripes, there's oil on the course. There isn't any oil on this day, but there's a lot of that stuff the weatherman has dropped down on them. Blue with orange stripes, you're being overtaken give way and the famous checkered flag for the winner and for the fellows who will finally finish the race. There's a view of the official's tent where the timers are keeping track of these cars individually and their individual speeds. Car number 53 in this race is driven by Jack German in a Dyna Panhard 54 sports convertible from Moline, Illinois. And there's the finish. The third race has been completed. And in Class F2, Norm Carlson of Itasca, Illinois, and a Porsche Super the is the winner. The now the fourth race. The gals watch as the cars line up and are ready to go for 28 and 5 tenths miles and a total of 15 laps. They're off. The flags are set for the use of the official starter. Communication with the turns and with the backstretch out of view of the finish line at the Iowa City Airport. Car number 45 and one of the fine automobiles in this race is driven by Bob McManus, a Chevrolet Corvette from St. Paul, Minnesota. Some of these cars have been made in the United States. Some of them are a foreign make. American production of sports cars has gone up magnificently the last few years with the advent of new sports car enthusiasm across the country. Here's that Corvette again, and car number 27 is driven by Don Davis, Austin Healey, 1954 make, Palatine, Illinois. The course is clear with a green flag out, as clear as it can be on this day. One car is stopped and warned by his pit crew and also by one of the officials. The Sports Car Club of America sets up their own official standards for the car, for the driver, for sanctions of the event, and of course for the way each race is run, rules, and the way that these cars are to compete. These drivers moving around the turns in fine fashion. All the cars are the same in that they have the same type tires, the same type displacement of the piston, and the same type of weight, and the same type motor, which is very important, of course, in the competition. And so these drivers are out there on the course much more for the love of it than they are for any other reason. And the finish of the fourth race is won now by Loyal Katsky of Omaha in a Jaguar XK120M. And you'll hear from Loyal Katsky later on, too. He's one of the outstanding drivers to compete. And now the fifth race. Here it's the time for the gals to move away. Sports car officials don't uh, forget the gals. They love baseball, but they love their sports cars, too. And this is their chance. Five laps, nine and five tenths miles. All classes, drivers must be members of the Sports Car Club of America or wives of members and must have passed regional competition requirements. 
So there you get a view of the gals. They uh, negotiate those turns just uh, a little bit more stiffly than do the men. They don't just slip and slide, and maybe after all, uh, the gals are the better and safer drivers. Who knows? That's up for argument, but they uh, like their sports cars just uh, the way the men do. The leader of this race uh, right now is Hope Stewart of Chicago in a Jaguar XK120. Car number 29 is being driven by Patricia B. Smith, an MGTD 50 production sports from Chillicothe, Illinois. These gals, I imagine, have been uh, interested in sports car racing either uh, while they were growing up or maybe their interest was uh, heightened a little bit by their husbands who own sports automobiles. Nevertheless, they have a wonderful time in their race and their moment at the Iowa City Optimus event. There's car number 26, and this one is driven by Don Wendorf, a Singer 52, Rock Island, Illinois. And now the finish of the race, and the winner was Hope Stewart. Here's one of the big races of the day. This one, the Optimus Trophy Dash, 20 laps, 38 miles, around the course just outlined to you, and they're off in one of the big ones. The fellow that breaks into the lead is Eddie Crawford of Michigan City, Indiana, in a Porsche competition. Bob Ballinger of Highland Park, Illinois, a Porsche Super. Norman Carlson of Itasca, Illinois, in a Porsche Super. These are the fellows who are going to battle it out in this 20-lap event. Around the turns they go, and this uh, finds the weather conditions worsening just a little bit because the rain is coming down harder than ever before. These fellows in their raincoats and in their helmets, their goggles won't do them too much good. Their vision is not very good out there on the Iowa City course right now. But the speeds haven't lessened a bit. Now it's turn, our turn for the cameraman to get just a little bit soaked. The pictures of this event are very spectacular, and the cameraman did an outstanding job. Under adverse conditions, they got soaked too. Coming around this turn, it looks as if somebody should have a speedboat. The turns are very, very slippery now. And a hydroplane here or there would uh, help out a little bit, or maybe a pontoon. It's so dark that the lights have to be turned on, the automobiles. But these fellows who like keen competition won't let a little rain or a little water stop them. Still out in front, in the Optimus Trophy Dash, is Eddie Crawford of Michigan City, Indiana. Straightaways are pretty clear. But these turns cause uh, no end of trouble to the drivers. It's certainly to their credit, though, that not a single mishap occurred on this afternoon. The driving was outstanding. The sportsmanship of a high caliber, and consequently, not even a skid, not even a slight bump recorded in the sports car race. That shows you some of the ideals of the Sports Car Club of America were being lived up to. Here's a fellow that is driving a motorboat, I think. Either that or a hydroplane. A couple pontoons on the side there would uh, help them out a little bit. And the winner of the sixth race was Eddie Crawford of Michigan City in his Porsche competition. And now the Iowa Trophy Dash around the same course. The weather has cleared a little bit. The wind has dried up the race course slightly. And for 20 laps, 38 miles, these cars are ready to do battle in the big one of the day. This is for sports, production sports, and unrestricted category cars under 1,500 cc. It's open only to qualified drivers with at least one race experience. The flying start after the pace lap, and they're off. These category cars, over 1,500 cc. The bales of hay are ready, just in case. There's car number 82, and this afternoon, that automobile is being driven by Matson Gregory of Kansas City. Everybody watching. Car number 8 moves up into contention, driven by Jimmy Elliott and MGTD from Minneapolis, Minnesota. The pit crew gives out with a little advice and some help. Pit crew working much the same as they do at Indianapolis to keep the driver informed as to his lap number. In case there's something wrong with the tire or the outside of the automobile, they can warn him. Some of these cars uh, sometimes get going so good that they wear the rubber right off the tires. Consequently, they have to be warned by that pit staff, although there are not any pit stops in the race, with the driver coming back on to win. Car number 46. One of the big cars in the race is driven by Eddie Crawford, a Porsche Sports Roadster from Michigan City, Indiana. That's one that you want to watch. Sid Ackerman in the Jaguar XK120 from Springfield, Illinois. The race gets down to its closing laps. There's car number 10, driven by Paul Clovis Jr., a Chrysler Special 54 Sports from Northbrook, Illinois. In the lead right now, in the Iowa Trophy race, is Lloyd Katsky of Omaha, Nebraska. 
the fellow who's the winner of the fourth race. He's driving a Jaguar XK120C. Aston Gregory of Kansas City in a Ferrari coupe is in the second place spot. Eddie Crawford of Michigan City in the Porsche competition is third right now. A crowd of 4,000 watches as they whir and strain around those turns. They wiggle and slip and slide a little bit, but nevertheless, they're all right. Great competition in the Iowa City sports car races. The Iowa City Optimus Club is to be congratulated on putting on this event, and the drivers are to be congratulated on the wonderful job that they've done in driving. And that high caliber of driving is still very, very uh, predominant here in this feature race of the day. The wind, the water, and the weather doesn't stop them. Round the turns and into the backstretch. And still in the lead is Loyal Katsky of Omaha, Nebraska. These fellows have all sorts of occupations. One fellow uh, that entered in this event was a tree expert. Some of them are manufacturers. Some of them businessmen, some of them playground experts. They just love sports car racing. They like to get out there and test their skill, their driving ability, and the speed of their car against the speed of another. And here's the winner of the feature event, Loyal Katsky of Omaha, Nebraska, the Jaguar XK120C. A lot of thrills in the Iowa City sports car race. racing cars. Most of their owners give them everyday usage, and the same cars serve them as transportation to and from the race. A driver may pack the family luggage in the rear seat, drive one or two thousand miles, race a hundred miles, and return home, all without even so much as a change of spark plugs. It's a pastime being followed by thousands of Americans each year. Figures show that the sales of sports cars have doubled every year. under conditions different probably from the type of race you're used to. This is a true road race, not a track race like Indianapolis audiences see. This road racing moved out of America in 1917, but is a flourishing sport in Europe today. And the end of the race. That's the big moment. These are all sports cars. They may be in the production class, meaning cars with no modification from the standard production model. Or they may be in the sports car class with individual modifications and one-of-a-kind specials. The third type, the unrestricted class, includes the Grand Prix racing cars, the big ones, and the small but fast Formula 3 cars. The unrestricted cars will be allowed in the last race only. Before the next race, we might look at some of these beauties like the Ford Thunderbird, Italian Maserati, Mercedes, Jaguar, the British Arnott Bristol, The familiar Jaguar XK120. The Mercedes 300 SL from France. 
the British MG, a low-priced sports car that's becoming more and more familiar on American highways. But today in Iowa City, the Jaguar is the most popular car. 32 of them listed in these races. In this next race, the women have a chance to show themselves the equals of men drivers. Most of them are wives of club members, driving the family sports car. Competition is keen in this all-women's race, with the girls out to show their men folks what they can do. With five laps to go, they pour on the horsepower, shooting down the straightaway at speeds near the 100 mark. This is Ruth Levick, driving a Jaguar XK120M. A lot of car for anybody to handle, but not too much for this lady from Minneapolis. They spread out now and get the all clear from an official waving his green flag. And it looks like car 100 is leading the field with plenty of room to spare. But it's still anybody's race as they battle it out on the straightaway. These gals, incidentally, and more than a dozen of them were on hand to compete, are driving under the same rules as the men do. And there's that beautiful sight, the checkered flag signaling the end of the race, the proud winner, Ruth Levy of Minneapolis, Minnesota. Yes, sir, she's earned her corsage today. And after her victory ride around the track, she's sending the roses to a driver injured in another race. A gesture of the kind of sportsmanship typical of these runs. The next race is a blistering 20 laps, 38 miles for sports and production sports cars under 1,500 cc. They're off in this Optimus Trophy race. I might mention here, there are no money prizes for these drivers. They're here for one thing and one thing only, the thrill of racing. Plus maybe the added thrill of winning. Their only reward is a $10 trophy, a wreath of roses, but mostly just the feeling of a wide open track ahead and clear sailing, and power unlimited under foot. For the second straight year, these races were sponsored by the Iowa City Optimus Club. Paul Shaw and his group are to be given a lot of credit for the wonderful job that they have done, the way the races were run off, and the handling of the crowd. Here you get a fine view of the turns where much of the competition is really red hot. Plus that, nearly 4,000 people were on hand in near perfect sunny weather watching these cars perform. On the straightaway, they get that reassuring green flag. Besides the green, they have a yellow flag for use caution, slow down. The red flag signifies the race has been stopped. White flag, ambulance or official car on the race course. The colorful yellow with horizontal stripes. Oil on the track, slippery, use caution. A black flag says, stop at your pit. Blue with an orange stripe, you are being overtaken, get one. And of course, the checkered flag tells the driver, you have finished the race. These drivers have brought their pet cars here today, cars like the Italian Ferrari, costing $12,000. Out on the course, they grind them over sizzling concrete. And believe me, it's sizzling this afternoon. They push them around impossible turns, inches and sometimes fractions of inches away from the spinning hubs of the next car. Tires are shredded, and gearboxes explode from the heat, scattering gear teeth over the track. But they keep coming back, more and more people each year, for this most exciting of sports. Out on the track, there's a real spirit of sportsmanship. And these drivers really demonstrate the SCCA's motto. Sportsmanship demands safe driving. Two cars battle it out for first place, both of them Porsche fighters. The end of the race is signal. And here's the winner. Bob Davis of Bloomington, Illinois, receives a flag that signals his victory and carries it around the track in his Porsche 550 Spider, a hot car today. And now the big race of the day, the unlimited class for sports and production sports cars over 1,500 cc. They'll go 20 laps for the total of 38 miles. Some of these big cars are the same as the ones used in Indianapolis, the Grand Prix type. The flying start calls for a pace lap, led by the official's car. An obstruction on the track necessitates a standing start instead giving officials time to clear the track. When these big cars bunch together on the turns, there's not much elbow room, you can be sure of that. A lot of thrills to see 4,000 fans continue to watch the feature race of the day. Some of the drivers come from as far away as California. Eight other states are represented here besides Iowa. Now they begin to fight for that number one spot. Number 55, the winner of the last race, is a strong contender in there at the moment. 
and number 55 is doing an outstanding job. Number 12 is driven by Loyal Katsky of Omaha, Nebraska, who was winner of the feature race last year. Here you get a close-up of it. Loyal Katsky is trying to repeat again, and the boy from Omaha is maintaining his lead in this race. Right now, it looks like car number 55 has made his bid. He has gone on the inside and has passed car number 12 and leads the race. Car number 55 and car number 12 continue the battle. Now, this race has developed into quite a show between these two guys, number 55 and number 12, as first one takes that lead and then the other. Davis and his little Porsche making a fine showing out there this afternoon. And now the winner is signaled. Lyle Katsky has duplicated his last year's win driving a Jaguar XK120C to his post decision over Bob Davis in this race. And that's it. We'll see you at next year's Optimus Club Race.